Hello, my friends. I have a magic sword and I can do many cool things. Be sure to subscribe to my channel. Yeager. I flinched from my daydream, knocking a neat stack of papers from my desk to the floor, which, along with my most certainly ridiculous appearance at the moment, earned me a salve of laughter from my co-workers. Fixing my glasses, I hastily lifted my sight, only to be greeted by the strict and spiteful eyes of my boss. Oh, hello, Miss Beeler. I half shouted, half whimpered, attempting in vain to look dignified. That's Miss Harker for you, Yeager. She spoke in her usual slave master tone. And just what were you doing dozing off there? I'm not paying you to sleep, I'm paying you to work. If you can call that pay, I muttered in my chin. What was that? Her expression was now sterner than ever. Nothing. I screeched with a forced smile. I was aware of the growing laughter of my colleagues. Her eyes narrowed to the point she almost looked like a vampire. Felt like one as well. Working for her was described as blood-sucking by almost all of her employees. Whenever she would walk into a room, I felt loose and it would feel like the temperature shifted by a fraction of a degree. Listen and listen well, Yeager. You only got this far because Jeleniak put in a good word for you. And I expect you to justify his words. Or else. Well, you'll only be useful as spare blood. Useful as spare blood. Her way of saying that I'll be fired, and one that was heard all too often, I believe I speak for all when I say we hated that catchphrase of hers. My most sincere apologies, Miss Harker. I'll get back to work straight away, I managed to speak through a fake grin. Very well. Carry on. She turned to face my co-workers. And what are the lot of you doing, snickering like a pack of hyenas? She yelled. Back to work. All of my co-workers swiftly turned to their computers, not eager to hear another round of scolding, but still shaking of muffled laughter. Thankfully, my shift was over in just an hour, so I was able to leave that hellhole quickly. Not quickly enough for my taste, though. Oh dear. I forgot to introduce myself, didn't I? Forgive my manners. Or the lack of them? My name is Michael Yeager, although most people call me Michael, I guess it's easier to pronounce. I was born in FR Yugoslavia as Michael Vukovic, in 1992. Faced with a poor economical state in the country, my parents emigrated to Germany the same year. My mother's grandparents, who escaped to Germany during World War II under false names, as a couple barely out of their teens took us in until we could stand on our own feet. For the same of simplicity, and to avoid some potentially nasty problems with the authorities, we renounced our original surname, and took on the surname that our grandparents coined for themselves, Yeager. When I was younger, I often asked my grandfather why did he choose that surname. His only response ever was, it is linked to the ancient history of our family, Mihi. Pray that you never find out. My grandparents passed away in 2003, both at the healthy age of 80 and only hours apart. When I turned 18, back in 2010, I moved out of my parents' house after saving enough money from part-times to rent a small apartment. It was actually only one sparsely furnished room that served as a kitchen, a bedroom, and a living room, with a small bathroom, but I didn't complain. I liked it that way. After a few failed attempts at finding a real job, I finally found one a few months ago, Dual Arc Incorporated, a small programming corporation, that would be absolutely perfect if not for that Nosferatu of a woman that was our boss. The salary was sad, but at least I wasn't starving. 
but back to the present. As I walked through dark, misty streets of Gruzlig, I hummed a melody of Marseillaise to myself. Ever since I learned it from Lorraine Morena's, my current girlfriend, I always thought it was catchy, and I loved humming it as a way to calm myself. I got to my apartment in about half an hour. Home sweet home. I proclaimed to myself out loud, tossing my dewy jacket aside, and setting a kettle on the stove. It was only then that I noticed a deviation on my lavender floor tiles, a large paper envelope. I had mail. Strange, my parents and I only ever communicated with Skype. They thought it was a marvel of modern science, and I didn't have any friends in foreign countries. And yet there it was, a single envelope of orange paper signed to my address. There was no sender address. Curious, I opened it up. Inside, there was a much smaller envelope of thick paper, yellowed with age, signed with elegant, curly letters that read. For instructions of our client, Hansel Yeager, formerly known as Jovan Vukovic, this letter is to be delivered to him on August 19, 2007, to his current address. In case of passing of our client, the letter is to be delivered to his oldest male descendant a day before his 20th birthday. I inspected the rear side of the letter, the sending date was 1941. He sent this letter over 70 years ago. But why? Why send a letter to himself? Unless he wanted to keep something of value to himself from being lost and forgotten. But why so far in the future? And holy crabs! Tomorrow is my 20th birthday? That's right, May 2nd. How could I've forgotten about it? Jobs can really kill a man's spirit, huh? I opened the letter. Inside there was a tiny fur bag with something hard inside. I untied the bag and turned it over my palm. A gleaming ring fell into my hand. I was bewildered, to say at the very least. I dropped the bag and brought the ring closer to my face to inspect it, it was made out of two metal bands, one black and one white, interwoven in an intricate pattern, and covered across the middle with another, thinner band, obviously made out of silver. The silver band was inscribed with a script that I recognized from one of my father's history books, Glagolitic. Even though my mother insisted I learned our ancestral language, I never bothered to learn Glagolitic, and I could only guess what the inscription meant. But that was now the least of my concerns. Why would I be worried about it? After all, the ring was so beautiful, so unique, so perfect. I was just about to slip it on. When a loud whistle snapped me from my stupor, I turned around faster than a fox, my wild imagination already conjuring flying monstrosities and carnivorous tank engines, and came face to face with a steaming kettle. Cursing, I dropped the ring and rushed to get the kettle. Of course, most of the water had been vaporized but I still had enough for a small cup. As I enjoyed my tea, my gaze wandered to the ring on the floor. I remembered my drunken fascination with it, and all of a sudden, it no longer seemed so perfect. Nevertheless, after I finished my tea, I picked it up from the floor it was now pleasantly warm to the touch for some reason and stuffed it back into the fur bag. I stashed the bag back in the envelope, and it was then that I noticed four words neatly written on the inside of it, in neat, narrow handwriting of my grandfather. Get rid of it. What the hell? Why send me the ring if I was just to destroy it? Do I look like Frodo Baggins? Then again, my grandfather was not a fool, and he certainly knew what he was doing. Pushing those almost disturbing thoughts aside. I took a shower and went to sleep. I was awakened next morning by soothing tones of stairway to heaven screaming in my ear. I turned the alarm off, as much as plants vocals were a balm to the soul. I needed some sleep. 
After what seemed like a minute, I got up and as soon as I looked on my phone, I was washed over in a chilling panic, it was 8.15. Bloody hell, I was working the morning shift today. I was late. I decided that a shower and a breakfast could wait, got dressed much quicker than I was used to, and rushed to my workplace. I was there in 15 minutes, a record, to be certain, but it was not enough. As I rushed by the clerk in an empty lobby he gestured me to stop. Wait, Yeager. He shouted. I stopped as if frozen solid. I turned to him and had a sight to see, a small cardboard box labeled with my name. Mr. Yeager, he started, sounding weary, Miss Harker wanted me to give you this box. He paused for breath and continued. She also said that you've been demoted to spare blood. I'm sorry. The expression on his face told me that he indeed was sorry. I thanked the old man, took the box and went home. Fired. On my birthday even. That definitely sounds like me. Well, no use in wallowing in my own misery, time to go looking for another job. At least I had a date with Lorraine to look forward to. I went home, had a breakfast and a shower, changed into less formal attire and waited. At 1600 hours, I decided to surprise Lorraine by showing up an hour early, I was usually always the one late. I went to our designated meeting place, Jade Meyer Onions, a small but good restaurant near the outskirts of the city. I could never get over the fact that it was named as it was, but the food was good. The atmosphere was homely, and the prices were fair, so I couldn't really complain. I walked inside and took a seat at the bar. I was almost immediately approached by the owner and a bartender, an aging man with a long hair, a bald patch above his forehead, and a perpetual smile on his face, all of which made him look like a retired rock star. Excuse me, boss, I asked used to address him like that. Did you see a girl in a rainbow shirt pass through here today? I, I did, lad, he answered in his deep baritone voice. The pretty brown one with green eyes, no? Yes, that one, I answered. The bartender grunted. Sorry, lad, you just missed her. Went behind with some tall red-haired one, he said and I could see the color drain from his face when he realized the weight of his words. I rushed behind, near the rhododendron bushes that served as a great cover. And I had a sight to see. Lorraine was there, naked, leaning against the wall, hugging my best friend and co-worker David Dave Jeleniak with both her legs and her arms. They were both covered in sweat and moaning, as Dave repeatedly thrusted into her. I watched, transfixed and stunned at the same time, unable to stop them, or even say anything, every moan and gasp cutting into my soul like the sharpest sword in the world. They kissed, and I felt a bizarre mixture of anger and melancholy bloom in my chest. They broke the kiss, and Dave spoke. Hey. Weren't you supposed to meet that Michael character here today? Lorraine's expression changed to an irritated one. I did, she said. And what of it? I thought he was your boyfriend, Dave muttered. Ha! Huh, you disable Louis, she laughed, and even though I did not understand her, I felt a part of me die off. I silently retreated back inside the restaurant and took my place at the bar. The bartender said nothing, and instead poured me a glass of J.J. Mister. I drained the glass and slammed it back on the bar. He refilled it, and I looked up to his face with my tearful eyes. On the house, lad, he said, his voice almost a whisper now. Five hours and as many Yeager misters later, I was staggering down the main street. The bartender was never cheap with the size of his drinks, and now I paid the price for that. After struggling for about twenty minutes to unlock the door, 
and overhearing a middle-aged scold some skinny, black-haired drunkard, I got into my apartment and dropped on the floor. It was like the force of the impact cleared my mind, and in a moment, tears started flowing like the waters of Danube. Damn that witch, Harker. Damn that harlot, Lorraine. Damn that backstabbing rat, David. A message arrived on my phone. It was Lorraine. Why didn't you show up today, dear? That was IT. That was the last straw. That, that whore was acting as if I was the guilty party here. I threw my phone at the wall, screaming like a lost soul and no doubt waking up a few of my neighbors. I heard a dull thump when a phone hit the wall, and another, sharper sound, of metallic object falling on the floor. It was the ring. How did it get out of the bag? How did it even get out of the envelope? How did it fall? Doesn't matter. It seems that my late grandfather was the only one not to bury me on my own birthday. Well, he and the bartender. To hell with it all, I decided. I might as well wear the damned thing. I picked up a ring and slid it on my right index finger. My entire body was immediately overrun by a tide of cramps that ended as soon as they came, giving way to total numbness. The air around me felt like a miasma. I blacked out as I fell on the floor yet again. I woke up in the dead of night. I felt like I'd been constricted by the world's largest snake covered in quills, and the world around me was fractured and blurry. Must have dropped my glasses, I thought to myself. But they were still on my face. I took them off and to my great surprise, realized that I beheld the room around me clearer than ever. I looked back to my glasses, cracked and bent like a piece of abstract art, looking so tiny and useless between my blue fingers. Wait, blue fingers? I shook my head, my hands were blue, and at the tip of each finger, a vicious black claw stood in a place of a nail must be my mind playing tricks on me. The room is dark, also. But I could see everything else like I was in dim light, and not pitch black, it made no sense for my hands to be an exception. I found the light switch and flicked it on, immediately blinded by intense white light. I raised my hands to protect my eyes. Unmistakably, they were dark blue, covered in sparse black hair, and strangely muscular. My eyes fell to my bare torso, it was hairless, dark blue, and bulky like I was an experienced lumberjack. I didn't even remember taking off my shirt. I searched for it with my eyes, it was near the place I fell, shredded in ribbons. Things were really starting to get freaky now. I decided to get to the bottom of this and flung open my wardrobe, looking at myself in the mirror built inside the inner side of the doors. As soon as my eyes fell on my reflection, I yelled in shock and surprise and a guttural growl escaped my throat. My skin was completely dark blue, covered with patches of dense black hair on my upper back and shoulders, but otherwise almost completely hairless. I was more muscular than ever. My once short black hair now fell past my shoulders, like a mane, hiding my almost elven ears covered in grey fur. But the most dreadful parts were my mouth and eyes. My lips were only a bit darker than the rest of my skin and could barely conceal long, canine fangs that stood out among numerous other sharp, pointy teeth in my jaw. And my eyes my eyes. My once brilliantly blue eyes were now a dark shade of what they used to be, with blacks clearer, and indigo irids. My pupils were tall and narrow, the eyes of a predator. After I overcame the initial shock, I looked at my right hand. The ring was still there. I removed it and felt a wave of heat run through my blood. Before my eyes, my skin paled. My body hair and ears contracted, and I reverted back to my old self. 
My eyes were still a bit darker than usual, but no longer in need of glasses. I put the ring back on, and with another wave of heat, I was the beast once again. Strangely enough, I felt good. With all the misfortune I had today, I should have felt like a garbage dump. Instead, I felt alive. More alive than ever. I sniffed the air, and it was full of scents I never felt so strongly before. I looked out of the window, just in time to see a pair of schoolgirls, no older than fifteen, walking down the street, I could tell the warmest parts of their bodies with but a glance. Their hearts, their necks, their lower abdomens. Despite a double panel window and about twelve meters of distance between us, I could hear them laughing, chatting about some boys from their class that they fancied. Their voices made me feel strange, I felt the need to go out and confront them, grab them, drive them to the ground, bite them, rip them. I turned my head, feeling the hunger go away. But it never truly left. It was still there, growling, demanding to be fed. And I would feed it. I looked once again at my hand, clenching it. Such power should not go to waste, I knew what I would do next. David lived about halfway between my apartment and dual luck, in a house that his parents left him. He was unpleasantly surprised, to see me at the small hours, but I let myself in. What the hell, man? He exclaimed as I pushed by him inside of his house problem, mate. I sounded jovial. Not going to refuse a surprise visit from your bro, eh? He was confused. No, but. Splendid. I cried vehemently. Let me pour us some drinks, shall I? I pulled out a bottle of scotch from his kitchen and poured us both a glass. I drained mine before offering his to him. He accepted it but was now frowning. Look, man, he began, we're brothers, but you can't just stroll into my house at night and drink my scotch like it's nothing. I felt the explosion of anger inside of me, but I repressed it, not yet. I take that this means you have trouble with me taking your things without question, eh? Yes. He yelled. I dropped my empty glass, and before it hit the ground, grabbed David by his face and pinned him to the wall. In one swift movement, I pulled the ring out of my pocket and slid it onto my finger. Dave's scream of terror as he witnessed my transformation was muffled by my growing hand. I snarled soothingly as if to say SHH, no more tears, but he only kept screaming. I decided I've had enough of it. I opened my jaws wide and went for the throat. Lorraine was striding near Strands Park, towards David's house. I messaged her from his phone, inviting her for round two. Now that I saw the eager look on her face when I stalked her from buildings, it almost made me sick. Almost? I started humming Marseille's best that I could with my bestial voice. It was deep but spread out, like every particle of the air was humming itself. She must have heard it, because she started looking around herself, now looking less eager and more frightened. Good. I leapt from the building and landed near Lorraine with a soft, inaudible thud. I took off my ring, and called to her. Lorraine, I cried. She turned around and gasped. Mon dear, Michael. What are you doing here? Just taking a walk. At this time of night? And what of you, my dear? She didn't answer. Lorraine, it just occurred to me, you are from Lowe's ear, are you not? Yes, she answered, confused. If I remember correctly, that region was once called Jevorton. She nodded. Do you fear the beast? I asked, grinning maliciously. I do not, she proudly exclaimed, with a smug smile on her face. You should, 
my dear, I responded in French, the language I didn't even know I knew. I watched her smile fade. How do you? She started in the same language. I unzipped my bag and threw her the item I held inside. She caught it, confused, and then let out the most blood-curdling scream, David's severed head grinned at her from her hands. She dropped it and backed away, before lifting her sight to where I stood. But the only thing to meet her eyes was incarnate of the beast of Jevorton. Before she could run, I was upon her. I grabbed her and dragged her off into the park. It was thick with furs. No one would see us, or hear her screams. Bela Harka was awakened by a loud, hasty knocking over the doors of her house. She opened them, only to see me, smiling widely at her. Good God, Yeja, what is it now? She yelled in her slave master voice. Good evening, Miss Harka, I said with my eager voice. What are you doing here? I'm not employing you again. I didn't come to ask for my job back. I simply wanted to say hi to you, Miss Mina. Listen here you. She stopped mid-word, shocked upon realizing of what I just called her, her pupils narrowed, looking almost feline now and then widened again as I pierced her chest with my left hand. I slid my ring in a split second that it took her to register my words, and now I took a firm hold of her warm heart, yanked it out, causing a torrent of blood to splash me from head to heel, and dropped it before her feet. She gave me one last surprised look, before crumbling to dust, unleashing hideous stench. Well, who have thunk? I said to myself, wiping my bloody hand on her rash-covered nightgown. Police interrogated me concerning the deaths of three people, all linked to me. I feigned fear and shock, ranting about how I was next. They dropped the matter soon enough probably thought I was a loony. Two months later, I moved to Schwarzwald and got a job in a local store. I kept the ring, and I still slip it on from time to time. For the villages of Schwarzwald are nothing short of a den of iniquity, filled with a game that suits me, so much deceit, so much treason, so many lies. And there is only one hunter to claim it all.